Hi, this is Diana Dini with Quality During Design. In this podcast episode, I'm talking with Emily Heidenminas. This interview is part of our series, A Chat with Cross-Functional Experts. Our focus is speaking with people that are typically part of a cross-functional team for new product development. We discuss their viewpoints and perspectives regarding new products, the values they bring to new product development, and how they're involved and work with product design engineering teammates. Emily is joining us today to talk about brainstorming for product development. She hosted a workshop at a conference about this topic titled Brainstorming, the Solution to Structured Problem Solving. I was intrigued, so I attended. I learned a lot of useful things, and I was very glad she agreed to share some of her insights with us on this podcast. We talk about some of the common pitfalls of brainstorming, but from a perspective of taking defensive action against those pitfalls. We go over the basic steps of brainstorming, but then circle back to the planning phase. There's a lot we can do in the planning phases, and Emily shares specifics about planning for brainstorming so we can get the most out of it, including setting up those defenses. She shares some of her best practices for leading a brainstorming session, and she shares the successes she's had with it and what her team thinks about it. I think you'll like how Emily uses brainstorming with her product development team, and that you'll be inspired to either take on brainstorming or change up how you're doing your sessions based on what she has to say. So enjoy this episode of A Chat with Cross-Functional Experts. Hello and welcome to Quality During Design, the place to use quality thinking to create products others love for less. My name is Diana. I'm a senior level quality professional and engineer with over 20 years of experience in manufacturing and design. Listen in and then join the conversation at qualityduringdesign.com. Welcome to Quality During Design, the place to use quality thinking to create products others love for less. I'm your host, Diana Dini. Today, we're talking about how product design engineers can maximize their relationship with teammates and their cross-functional groups. We have a special guest today, Emily Heinemenos. I met Emily at an IEEE conference where she was having a workshop, and I thought what she had was very valuable, and I really enjoyed what she had to share. So I invited her to the show, so I'm really glad that she joined us today. A little bit more about Emily. She has a master's degree in design and manufacturing engineering from the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. After initially working as a design engineer, Emily left and moved into new product development quality engineering position. In this role, she worked with multiple cross-functional engineering teams to ensure the effectiveness of quality systems while earning her Six Sigma Black Belt certification. Now, as a chief engineer for next-generation high-voltage automotive products, she aims to grow and develop a team of technically competent individuals who realize their maximum potential. Welcome, Emily. I'm glad you could join us today. Thank you for having me, Diana. Now, you are here with us to share your viewpoint and expertise about brainstorming, how to use it successfully for problem-solving, and some of your guidelines for best practices. Um, I loved your workshop at the IEEE conference. I thought it had a lot of great ideas. Thank you. Generally, a little more about um, your background and and how you relate to new product development engineering. You are a new product development engineer yourself, but now you're also leading engineers? That's correct. I currently have a team of uh, three direct reports. However, I do have a, a broader team of indirects as well. And my team is really focused on developing kind of our next generation of high voltage products for the business unit that um, we're working in. So we're very focused on new product development. Uh, in my previous role as a quality engineer, I was also working on supporting new product development. And there it was a, a little bit different because I, I didn't have control over the design. I really had to influence the design team and our process teams on creating a design with quality in mind. And that's really where I kind of 
you could say fell in love with brainstorming was in my role as a quality engineer kind of going through uh, my journey of getting my Six Sigma black belt and learning about you know, structured problem solving, but then also learning how to have Kaizen events, which is is really kind of where I, I think I learned the most about having a brainstorming session or having an effective brainstorming session was running multiple Kaizen events in my previous role um, where other business units would basically come to the NPD quality group with a problem. They want to solve a design or a process problem, and they would ask our team to help facilitate kind of a, a week-long Kaizen event, um, which we called a, a tiger team. And that's where I got most of my experience in brainstorming. And now in my new team, I really look to try to utilize all those tools I've picked up along the way around running effective brainstorming sessions. And in my new team, we do on a much smaller scale. So I'm not having week-long events, but we'll have events that span a couple of hours and really try to tackle one specific problem we're having throughout our current development process. That's really interesting to hear about how you had developed these skills over a couple different work experiences. I hadn't realized until um, earlier today when we were setting up for, for this interview that you had such a strong background in quality. So I thought that was very interesting. It's not your typical career path, I think, to move from quality into design engineering, but it's definitely having significant benefit in, in designing new products. Cause I can say I can design a product with quality in mind because I worked in quality so long. Yeah, that's interesting. Now, uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to go to your workshop at the conference, and this is the IEEE Women in Engineering Conference, your topic was brainstorming. And I thought, wow, I would really like to hear what somebody else has to say about that. Because in my experience, brainstorming, um, people either they have a love-hate relationship with it. You know, they it's always something that people think is very approachable and doable. They want to give it a try. But it's been my experience and then with the other people that I talked with that their brainstorming sessions haven't been very fruitful. Um, they haven't been able to really develop a solution. So some of that comes with not understanding how to talk with others, or they're afraid that too many people are going to make a solution complicated. And it's just one of those things where we don't want to spend time talking and not moving forward. Now, you you had shared with me a Harvard Business Review article, Why Group Brainstorming is a Waste of Time. And it got into it hit some of those pain points for me. Like, yeah, I've seen that. But that article didn't really offer any solutions. It just kind of highlighted some of the pain points we have with brainstorming. Whereas you, you're offering some solutions to those pain points. And um, and that's what I really loved about your message and what you have to share. When you are starting and scheduling a brainstorming session, we really want to have a solution that has the most impact or benefit. And we want to work with our team and activities that are meaningful. So what are some of the things that you want to accomplish when you structure brainstorming with your groups? So I would say the first thing that I look for when I'm getting ready for a brainstorming session is I do spend time to plan my session. That will, will help knowing what do you want to accomplish? And if you do read that Harvard Business Review article, there's kind of these four productivity blockers, bystander effect, when people might not want to do something because they think someone else will do it, evaluation apprehension. This is really when other people will be worried or concerned about how team members might perceive their ideas. Um, production blocking, this is where no matter the group size, individuals can only orally express a single idea at a time. And one of the last ones the article talks about is called groupthink. And this is where your participants in the group could make ill-informed decisions due to the urge to conform, right? So that they might not want to be outside the status quo. So knowing what the productivity blockers or the reasons why 
maybe brainstorming session you've been in or tried to facilitate in the past was not productive, you can kind of take a defensive approach in planning your brainstorming session to purposefully create the flow or select your brainstorming tool to combat these productivity blockers. Now, you you had some particular concepts that you shared at the workshop. Would you do you care to share one of one of the concepts that you have? Sure, Nana. And I can give a, a high-level overview quickly of kind of the seven steps that I use. And you would need to watch out for some of these productivity blockers. Um, and we can go into maybe one or two in detail. But the first one I mentioned is step one. You want to define your problem. So you want to understand what am I trying to solve? Why am I asking all these people to come together into this workshop? And you want to make sure that your problem statement or you can create a challenge statement is written in a way that it is solvable and that it is a positive action. And that way it will encourage creativity. So just instead of just outlining the problem, you're sort of setting the team up for, for a mindset of positivity to find a solution to the problem. Is that right? Exactly. You really want to say, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Your challenge statement or framing your problem is really your team's call to action. So you can use this throughout the workshop to keep the team focused on what is the problem we're trying to solve. And you want to make sure that it, it's clear so that the team can digest it and also be able to work towards solving that problem. Now, is this something that you would share before the meeting, like a couple days where you give people time to think about it? Or is it something that really gets evolved and solidifies at the time you set up the meeting? I've done both. Uh, I think it depends on your participants. In the past or my most recent workshop, I framed our challenge statement during the actual session. And in the email leading up to the meeting, I went over with my team, here's what I'm wanting to solve in this problem because my team right now, we meet every day. So we're very well synced. If we were not meeting every day and the team didn't already know kind of why we were having that meeting, then I, I would encourage you to send your challenge statement out at least a day or two in advance or more preferably actually with the meeting invitation. So that way when the participant gets that meeting invitation that comes across on their calendar, they can clearly see and make that connection as to why was I invited to this meeting, right? What are we trying to solve? And they can already start to think about what they can contribute to that session. Okay. Having everybody on the same page is important. And then uh, what is, what is the next step? So once you frame your challenge, you want to think about the participants that you would like to include in your session. So you want to keep in mind kind of two things when you're defining who should attend, how many actual people you invite, and each individual's level of experience. So another Harvard Business Review article talks about uh, how many people should be invited to a brainstorming session. And seven is the sweet spot for the number of participants. If you invite fewer than three, you can make it difficult to establish a free flow of ideas. And by inviting more than seven, you'll need to mind the bystander effect, which we talked about just a moment ago, where mm -hmm. you might have people kind of just sitting back because they think someone else might do a task or come up with a better idea. So you want to mind how many participants that you have. And also have a cross-functional team as far as their job role, but also make sure that you have a different levels of experience in your session as to either how long that they've worked in industry, but also how much experience do they have with that particular topic. And in, in your experience, what benefit does it have to have people from different experience levels? How does that work for you and your teams? I think that is a great question. Um, the experts that you have on your and your team can really provide pointers and tips on the topic. 
Um, and then the non-experts can really challenge those pointers and tips. So you can get this you know, really good balance between experts saying, oh, I've tried this or have you considered this? And the non-experts or those that have uh, fewer years of expertise can really ask very challenging questions, stay very curious during the session and have a really great dialogue. Oh, interesting. We have frame your problem and then inviting your team. And what's the third step? Your next step in your planning journey is selecting the method to, uh, that you'll utilize for brainstorming. Um, there are so many different brainstorming methods. So that's why you really need to think about what is the problem that you're trying to solve? Who's going to attend the session? That will help you narrow down some methods that you could use for brainstorming. Um, and you also want to take into account like how much time do you think you're going to have for the session? What resources do you have available? Um, but we can also talk about those in the later steps. Okay. So. Yes. And that that's probably a spot um, that I could use more practice on is choosing the right brainstorming method, considering all those things you just mentioned, the problem, who's attending, and and the kind of resources that you have. Um, but yeah, let's talk about that later. So those, those three steps are part of the planning. Is there anything else we should be thinking about for best success with brainstorming when we're planning? Yes, you'll want to select your, your method, and then part of brainstorming is you're going to generate all of these ideas. And they might not all be good ones, but part of brainstorming is refining and combining ideas. So after you select your initial brainstorming method, you'll want to also identify how will you go from your quantity of ideas to quality ideas? And how will you refine them and prioritize your ideas? That would be kind of your next step that you would go through for that um, idea selection. So um, during the meeting, everybody's generating ideas, uh, but then the next step within that generating ideas, moving from just the vast number of ideas, getting into something that you want the team to focus on to, to work. What's a method or or two methods that you use to be able to do that? Does that depend on the method that, that you choose? It can. Um, for both defining your brainstorming technique and how you refine and prioritize your ideas, one of my favorite ways is to utilize a tool or a visual that will allow the brainstorming participants to first do some independent brainstorming or self-reflection, which when you think of brainstorming, you might think of everyone working together. They are working together. I'm just a, a large proponent of kind of a silent first activity. And that will help you with many of your by many of your productivity blockers all at once. Um, because now you've assigned everyone a specific task. So everyone has a task that will help combat bystander effect. Everyone will be very busy on their own individual brainstorming at first. So they'll be too worried about their own brainstorming to really think of how will others perceive my ideas. And you can also utilize for evaluation apprehension, you can also make sure that you limit the ability for others to identify whose idea that was, right? So everyone throws them out there, but no one quite knows whose idea that was. That will also help with the production blocking because now it's not an oral activity. It's it's a individual activity where people are, are writing and, and they're quiet. Yeah, you did this in your workshop with us too, because it was a workshop. You uh, you know, when I entered the room, there were stacks of post-it notes and a bunch of strangers. And <laughs> and I ended up uh, teaming up with people that I didn't know at all. I'd never met them before. And uh, we were, you did that first silent step. And I experienced that too, that I liked that. I liked being able to get my ideas out there. You know, I was with my group. I knew we were going to be working together. 
but it did take some of some of the pressure off and it did address some of those issues that you talk about. And um, yeah, I really liked how you did that. Thank you, Diana. And I think you know, that's one of the biggest things you can do to improve the effectiveness of your brainstorming session is really starting with the silent first activities. And I also always add a time component to them. And that way, the team is working on a task. They have a limited time. So they'll be they'll be very focused at the task at hand. You'll get multiple ideas. And then we can come together and have a discussion after. Um, but at least it gets all of the ideas out there quicker and helps with a lot of these productivity blockers. Yes. After everybody's had their independent brainstorming session, what, what would be the next thing to happen? So that's when you start to prioritize the ideas and group them together. So one of my favorite tools for brainstorming is using uh, stickies. That can either be in real life or there's plenty of virtual whiteboards where you can have different stickies. And after you have all of these ideas, you want to group them together in like ideas and then work to refine those, right? Maybe you come up with a great idea Diana and I have a similar idea. We can merge the two of them together and make an actionable idea from from those two ideas. So that's what you'd want to do once you have this plethora of ideas is is combine and refine them to, again, go from the the quantity of ideas to your quality ideas. And to do that, you can just physically move the post-its. And again, this can be a silent activity and you can discuss afterwards. So you can envision everyone just grabbing post-its and putting them next to like ideas or ideas they think go together. Then you can have a conversation around it. And once you have those ideas grouped, you still might have too many. And that's when defining how you will prioritize those ideas comes in handy. And for prioritizing those ideas, you can use quite a few different um, prioritization methods. I think the easiest one is just a a two by two square where the team or the facilitator ahead of the session comes up with what are the two sets of criteria I want to rate these ideas against, whether it's time and impact You can have value versus effort, risk versus reward, urgency versus importance, and then everyone moves the grouping of ideas or your refined ideas around on your two by two matrix. And that's really going to be the, you know, what you prioritize things on. You mentioned a a few examples. That's really going to link back to your problem statement and the first one, I would, I would think. Exactly. So that's why if if you do plan ahead in the session to say, what two criteria will I use for this two by two? That is is one way to approach it and make sure it aligns with your challenge statement. Sometimes I'll also try to get buy-in of those in the session. So I will already know what the two criteria I would prefer to use. But I'll ask the group you know, what criteria do we think would be best to prioritize these against and see if they come up with the same answer as I do. They might come up with something better than I had originally anticipated, but I always just want to check that it will it will help um, me come up with what are the actionable ideas that I can walk away with to solve my challenge statement. And that's really where um, you can leverage the brainstorming activity <laughs> to get to the next step. After after you've prioritized, what happens next? So in the actual session, after you've prioritized the ideas, you can assign action owners or however you want to kind of handle your ideas. Um, you can decide, you know, which quadrants of your two by two matrix the team is going to actually go and execute and take time to assign owners. If that, if you're in the actual session, that's kind of what you would do next to wrap up the brainstorming session. So you gave us a seven-step process for doing brainstorming during our new product development for engineers, framing the problem, uh, choosing and inviting your team, selecting the method, generating ideas, grouping and prioritizing, and um, down-selecting as part of that prioritizing method. 
And then also assigning action items to to what comes out of the brainstorming session. Do I have all of that right? Is there anything I missed? As, as far as the key ones, down, I think those are, are great. Now that we know all the steps that it takes to do brainstorming, there's some things that we can do for planning. You have some extra tips for us, right? If you're still in your planning method, after if you selected that, yes, I would like to use a two by two matrix and I would like to use these two criteria to rate it, I would, in, in the preparation side, you'd want to think more about uh, what do you need to facilitate your brainstorming session? Because now you've defined your problem. You will know how many people are going to attend. You've identified your method for brainstorming and also how you will prioritize and down select ideas. So we want to think about, you know, do you need a physical space? Do you need some sort of online platform if you're working in a virtual team? Do you need any physical materials like stickies and pens, for example? And then also kind of how can you make the environment of the actual meeting uh, encourage creativity? The, the next step is really thinking about your agenda. And in planning your agenda, you're initially doing it for yourself to identify how long do I want to have the session, the session for how much time do I need for each activity within my session. You also want to make sure that you just send out your agenda before your your session. Um, and the last step of planning is to, to put that meeting invitation on everyone's calendars. Yeah, part of preparing everybody for this brainstorming meeting. Exactly. So you, you touched on something that when we talked in the workshop, I found a little bit uh, surprising, or I just, I guess I hadn't thought of it before, that these brainstorming sessions, it's not like everybody just haphazardly gets together and has a bunch of ideas and then finds a solution, that this kind of session can span over a few days. Is that right? That's correct. But there, there is no like right or wrong answer for how long a brainstorming session should be. You just need to take into consideration that if you are having a day long brainstorming session, you want to schedule breaks in your agenda, schedule time for the team to get up, walk around, leave the room, uh, do a fun activity um, to, to get your, your mind out of brainstorming a little bit, and then you can come back with a fresh perspective. On my team, most recently, we have been having, like I mentioned earlier, kind of smaller brainstorming sessions where we'll meet for an hour and a half to two hours. And we might meet on a Monday and then we'll come back to it on a Wednesday and finish our brainstorming. And this will also help us because when we come back to our board, we can say, OK, do, does, does our task, does our idea refinement still make sense? Right. And then continue through that brainstorming process. Now, how you say uh, like your your current one, you're you're doing it over two days. What's the longest brainstorming session that you've had, and how did it work out compared to these shorter bursts? Do you have an opinion about that? Yes. Yeah, so in my previous MPD quality role, I mentioned I was leading these larger tiger team events where we would actually have a meeting that started on a Monday morning and would end on a Friday morning. So we would have almost four and a half days of brainstorming session. And, and there the agenda was very critical. We wanted to make sure that we had time to really frame the problem. These were much larger brainstorming sessions. So our challenge statement here was around generating new technology concepts and working through our concept phase of our new product development cycle, getting 30% of that phase done in those four days. So oh, we wow. have a very large scope of those workshops, whereas now in the workshops I'm leading with my team, we have a very defined challenge statement. Um, for example, we recently had a brainstorming session on how we could improve our capability for one specific test that we wanted to run. So very much a smaller scope from these week-long sessions um, where we have much larger teams. So we, we might have, you know, 30 people in the room. We would break up into sub-teams within that week-long period. And again, making sure that our sub-teams are 
more than three, but not more than seven, and give each team a, you know, specific tasks or specific sections of the problem. So it depends on the type of problem that you're looking at or, or the scope of what it is you're trying to solve. And that makes sense. It might take longer and more meetings to work through with a team. What kind of feedback have you gotten from your team about this brainstorming session? Is this a common tool that you use a lot or do you bring it out for special occasions? We don't use it too frequently. Again, there's a lot of time that goes into uh, prepping your session. It all depends on, again, how large a problem you're trying to solve for these smaller sessions. I'm I've got it down to, I spend about 20 to 30 minutes prepping for the session, but that's because I've, I've done multiple. I really don't want to burn my team out with the idea of brainstorming either. So we really use it when we can write that challenge statement where we have a specific problem that we're needing to solve that we just, we can't get there with having conversations when we need a more structured approach to solving that problem. So for us, I'll go back to my example I used earlier, we were struggling to figure out how could we improve our performance in one of our tests that we need to run for our product. We could not do that just by having these free fluid conversations. We did try. So I, I asked the team, you know, let me schedule a brainstorming session and we can go through a more structured way of coming up with these ideas. Um, and at the end of that session, we had generated 80 ideas in just 10 minutes. Those 80 ideas were refined into 19 feasible actions. Those 19 feasible actions were prioritized into eight that we could actually implement for our next round of testing. Seven of them were implemented and we were actually able to improve our performance in that test by 7X. Um, so we got really great feedback from the team. We got really great feedback from upper management when we kind of walked them through our process, showed them the results that we got from this brainstorming session. Um, and now I think my team is, is excited when we have these smaller brainstorming sessions because we're able to accomplish so much in just two to four hours. Well, that's great. And congratulations on that. Those are um, great numbers that you're <laughs> putting out there. That does sound like a success. What's one thing engineers can do today to improve work with their team for new product design? Just uh, something small of quick win or a small step? I think something that you can do is when you're trying to solve a problem, even if it's a small problem, start practice writing your challenge statement. And that way, when you go through whichever problem solving methodology you utilize, you can go back to your challenge statement and say, did I achieve my goal? Um, the challenge statement will also help get your whole team on the same page. So you write it down on paper and the whole team is in agreement as to what we're trying to solve. And you can really make sure that everyone is interpreting, interpreting it in the same way. And the third thing that that challenge statement will help you with is to communicate to your upper management. This is the problem that we're trying to solve. And then again, you can go back to it when you have solved the problem. That's great advice. And uh, do you have any recommended reading podcasts or websites for engineers related to brainstorming or just in general that you've found helpful in helping to solve engineering problems? Yes. Um, so I mentioned the, the few of the Harvard Business Review articles. So I really enjoy reading their articles. I think they have some great content. Uh, my team has been utilizing virtual whiteboards through Miro, and they have some really great resources. I actually read quite a few of their articles when I was prepping for my IEEE session, um, and I would highly recommend looking on their website. They have lots of recommendations on um, you know, a, a different but similar steps for planning your virtual brainstorming session. They also, if you're looking for um, additional resources on alternative brainstorming tools. If you don't want to use stickies and rapid ideation, which is my go-to, uh, they have uh, great explanations of 
brainstorming tools and prioritization tools. And it's all in one place. So that's why I like that particular resource. I'm in no means attached to it in in another way besides I think they have great content. Okay. And I I can link to those articles and that uh, website on the blog for this podcast. Yes, I can send them to you. Okay, great. Now, how can the audience find out more about you? Are you open for communication? How would you like to connect? I am. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, so you can definitely find me there. You can send me a message if you want to connect more on anything I've talked about today or share any brainstorming tools and techniques that you use. I'm always looking to learn more and apply that within my team in developing new products Um, And and LinkedIn is definitely the easiest way to get a hold of me. Well, I am so glad that you joined us today. I'm glad I met you at the conference. And um, I learned even a little bit more today. I appreciate you coming on the show and talking with us. Thank you so much for this opportunity again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Emily. If you like this topic or the content in this episode, there's much more on our website, including information about how to join our signature coaching program, the Quality During Design Journey. Consistency is important, so subscribe to the weekly newsletter. This has been a production of Dini Enterprises. Thanks for listening.